All right, guys, can you guys hear me? Okay, guys, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, so let's give it one more minute while we're receiving more attendance. Okay, today is our first lecture for the knowledge base session. So we might have some new students, they might have some technical issues. So let's give it one more minute while we're receiving more attendance. So by the way, how's your AMC 10? How do you like your AMC 10A? Tomorrow we're gonna have the 10B, right? But how do you like the 10A? It's difficult, right? Yes. Unfortunately, that's the trend. The complexity of all the AMCs is actually becoming harder, 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 and there's no way around. So that's the reason why, you know, when we doing when we were doing our mock test, right? We are actually talking about. <clears throat> So we're talking about how to increase the complexity. And, uh, you know, these days, everything has become more and more complicated. That's the big trend and there's no way around. And also I realized these days they're trying to give you more real problems, right? Not only a theoretical problem, so on and so forth. It's only there are like the real problems, AKA there will be more technical background, right? You're gonna apply all the technologies into the real problems. And also on top of that, the calculation, the load of calculation is also spiking up. So with everything together, we're really gonna see more and more complicated AFC problems. So that being said, if you wanna do some preparations, it's always important that you want to prepare a little bit ahead, right? Try to be more well-prepared before you'll be able to take care of the problems. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think we can get started. So welcome guys, welcome to our knowledge base lecture because we have already done for our AMC 10 bootcamp. Now we're gonna go back to our regular knowledge based lectures. In this lecture, we're gonna focus on our session six, which is the trigonometry, the complex number and the planar vectors. So before we get started, as a common practice, let me try to give you a quick preview what we will be covering in our session six. Let's have a quick forecast, okay? So this is what we're gonna cover in our session six, trigonometry. I have to say trigonometry is kind of unfamiliar for most of the students, right? Generally speaking, if you're talking about the algebra, you guys should be very familiar with the functions, equations, polynomials, quadratics, so on and so forth. However, trigonometry might not be very, very familiar to you guys, which makes sense because previously the trigonometry is only focused for the AMC 12 students. But these days, like the complexity of the AMC 10, AMC 12 is growing up. So you're still gonna see some problems for the AMC 10. And also for the Canadian side, if you wanna go to Kaylee, some format, you might from time to time see some AMC problems, uh, see some like trigonometry problems. So that's the reason with all the background, we like to, especially for your, our like AMC 10 level students, we also like to introduce some basic, basic information regarding the trigonometry. So this is kind of like a snapshot of what we will be covering for our trigonometry sections in our 10 lectures. So we're gonna spend some time today talking about the trigonometry basics because trigonometry actually has so, so many definitions, but all those flowery complicated definitions will be elaborated from the basic, basic foundations. So today, the first topic, we're gonna to talk about some trigonometry basics. Uh, kind of like the definition, you know, so on and so forth. With all those definitions, we will be able to introduce some trigonometry functions and their properties. Because in our previous lectures, especially in our functions and advanced functions lectures, we have, how we have already introduced, there's so many tools, so many methodologies to evaluate a function. Regardless of trigonometry function or logarithm function, what kind of like functions they would be able to be evaluated by all the tools. And we're going to be using exactly the same tool, help us to evaluate the trigonometry functions. 
And then moving forward, we're gonna go to the trigonometry identities, which is the most complicated part. Because people, whenever we talk about a trigonometry, people are always scared by the complicated formulas. There are hundreds of formulas for you to remember, right? AKA there are too many identities for you to remember. Not to say remember, you also have to basically apply those formulas in different problems. So that's gonna be our focus for our lecture. We're gonna teach you guys a bunch of quick ways or shortcuts, how to remember those trigonometry identities, and most importantly, how to utilize those identities to solve the real problems. So that's gonna be the focus for our lecture for sure. And moving forward, we're gonna talk about some application for the trigonometry, how to apply them in the 2D geometries. So think about it. Previously, when we talk about the 2D geometry, we actually introduced that there were two ways to do 2D geometry problems. If you can recall, this is what we introduced. The same thing as our in our basic knowledge lectures and also in our boot camp. One is the using the traditional 2D geometry way using the similarity, the congruency, so on and so forth. Try to put them into triangle, try to see the relationship between different lines, different angles, so on and so forth. Or alternatively, you can actually use the coordinate geometry, right? Coordinate geometry is also a very powerful way help you guys to solve some relatively complicated 2D geometry problems. So instead of using the similarity congruency, you can try to do some calculation, right? Using the calculation, you can basically convert the complicated thinking process into a relatively easy calculation process. I keep saying calculation is easy or calculation is cheap. If you do not do the calculation, the computer will do the calculation on your behalf. However, if you just wanna do the thinking, sometimes it took forever for you to think of one of the auxiliary line. So that being said, we have already introduced two ways how to solve the 2D geometry problem. And also after our session, you're gonna find a third way. Using the trigonometry, it can also help us to basically do some weird, complicated 2D geometry problem. We're gonna basically give you guys some sample problems and show you the way how to use trigonometry to do the 2D geometry problem. And moving forward, we're going to talk something about the inverse trigonometry and the trigonometry inequality, something fairly light. That's going to be focused on our trigonometry part. And then moving forward, we're going to spend some light paragraph talking about the complex number. So these days, we're more talking about the real numbers, right? A complex number is something that cannot be covered by all the real numbers. So there might be something like the imaginary part by the time that we'll talk about it. And also the complex number can be seen in the complex plane, kind of like our Carson plane. You'll be able to see the X axis, the Y axis, and we'll be able to talk about it, about the basic, basic the, uh, introduction definition for the complex number and how to use the complex number. And the reason why I put a complex number under the trigonometry session is that one of the most important application or kind of a property of complex number can be utilized using the trigonometry. So trigonometry is a very good assistant for you to understand the complex number and use it in a real way. The same thing, we're gonna talk about our factors because vectors is quite similar to the complex number. They're actually using x, y, two axes in order to present the denotation of our vectors. And again, you can use the vectors to try to solve some 2D geometry problems as well. So generally speaking, our lecture for our 10 lectures is gonna be more focused on the trigonometry for sure. And also in the later half of our lecture, we're gonna share a little bit of workload with the complex number, 2D geometry, so on and so forth. All right, this is really a short and brief forecast what's gonna be covered in our 10 lectures. So far, so good? Perfect. If all good. So let's go to our lecture number one. Let's talk about the trigonometry basics. Trigonometry basics. So talking about the trigonometry, people might ask a question, 
why you want to talk about a trigonometry? Why you like to introduce such a new concept and using the concept for us to process our problem, so on and so forth. So that being said, we have to answer the first question, why trigonometry? So talking about the trigonometry, I think most of the time we'll start our discussion from a triangle. For instance, most of the time we have a right triangle. Okay, let's say this is A, this is B, this is C. So if you can recall previously in our 2D geometry session, we have already talked about all the geometry problem are basically focused on three major topics. Geometry problem. One is talking about the side, right? To see two sides that are the same or they're parallel to each other, or you wanna find some relationship. The second one is talking about the angle, right? To see two angles that are supplementary, complementary, or two angles are the same or they follow a certain relationship. Or the third one is the area, right? Like I said, from the AMC's perspective, they were more focused on the side and area rather than the angle, right? We have already talked about it so many times in our regular lectures and in our bootcamp. So these are actually the three basic foundations for the 2D geometry. So as long as people realize the two, like the three basic foundations, people will always ask for a question. So the side and the angle, they are two major components for the 2D geometry. A lot of interesting properties, they're elaborated from these two concepts. But how can I combine these two parts together? The side and angle, is there any relationship between these two major important concepts or they're totally independent? No one is actually touching each other. So this is actually a question our mathematicians are trying to figure out. And to be more specifically, if we go to a right triangle, okay? In a right triangle, let's say we have three sizes, ABC, right? Now, if I have a theta here, which is the measurement of the angle, so what's the relationship between ABC, three sizes, and the theta value, right? So this is kind of like the very intuitive question that people want to ask. So how can I combine the side information and the angle information together and taking from there solve the problem? So this is actually the background why people want to have some investigation about the size and angle. And this is actually where trigonometry, the concept of the trigonometry was actually raised. So now we have to do some definition. We define, okay? As long as I use the word define means there is no reasoning. People just say that. We have a mutual agreement, we define that, that's it. Okay, don't ask me why, this is the definition. So basically you wanna find out the relationship between the different sizes and the theta, right? So people defined sine theta equals to A over C. Sine theta, yeah, this is only a definition. We define sine theta equals to what? This is actually a ratio between the opposite side of the theta over the hypotenuse. Okay, there's no reason that people just define that. Okay, so we give a name. This is the sinusoid of a theta value. And also we define the cosine theta equals to B over C. Again, same thing, no reasoning, no explanation. We just define the adjacent side of an angle over the hypotenuse. We defined as a cosine theta. No reasoning, we just do that. And also we define the third one, tangent of theta equals to A over B. A over B, A is the opposite side of the angle, which is here. And B, B is the adjacent side, adjacent uh, of say like the lag, right? With the right lag of the triangle. So we give a name, this is A over B. That's it. There's no reasoning. People just come to uh, understanding this is the definition, that's it. And also sine theta, cosine theta, and tangent theta, they are the three most important trigonometry. So most of the discussions we'll be, we're gonna be having for this entire lectures will be basically focused on these three, okay? This is only like a preference. But also these are three very important trigonometries. And people also defined another three, not that important, but still very 
useful trigonometry. The first one is cosecant. Cosecant theta is actually defined as the reciprocal of sine theta, which is c over a. Again, it's a definition. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. There's no reasoning. People just like to use it. That's it. And we define a secant theta. S e c secant theta is defined as the reciprocal of cosine theta, which is c over b. Again, people just do such a definition. And the last one is cotangent theta. Cotangent theta is defined as the reciprocal of tangent theta, which is b over a. Okay, like I said, all the way comes to here, there's no reasoning, people just define that. And actually, after you take it as this, that's the definition, you just have to take it as this, we already have the basic, basic six very important trigonometry eight trigonometry definitions, okay? So these are the six things we're gonna talk about for this entire lecture. And also, like I said, these four and um, these three are actually more important. Okay, so this is actually where the definition comes from. We just try to use our definition to present sine, cosine, so on and so forth. And also before we move forward, let's have another quick talk. So now you can find out all those definitions that are actually raised in the right triangle, okay? Right triangle. So as long as talk about the right triangle, your first reaction is what? Pythagorean theory, right? a squared plus b squared equals to c squared, which is the Pythagorean theorem. So that being said, this is not a random triangle, right? You have to do all the definitions within the right triangle. And because of the right triangle has such a Pythagorean theorem, so that really implies that for our trigonometry definition, sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, uh, cosecant, secant, cos, cotangent, there might be some relationship because you have a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So therefore, there might be some relationship help you to basically understand all those trigonometries. For instance, a very intuitive example is, you see, sine theta, I'm just gonna put it here, sine theta equals to c over a, cosine theta equals to b over c. So sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta so the way I want to do this square means you want to take a perfect square for this entire expression. But try to make our life a little bit easier. I want to put the square here, kind of like exponents, right? So what is sine square plus cosine square? C square, A square, B square, C square. Uh, oh, excuse me. A square, sine theta is A over C, right? A over C, A square, C square, right? So that one is gonna be C square, A square plus B square equals what? A square plus B square just equals to C square. So C square, C square equals to one. Voila, now you have sine square theta plus cosine square theta equals to one. So that being said, regardless what's the value for theta, theta can be 60 degrees, 35 degrees, 22 degrees, whatever, you're always, always gonna have a relationship between sine theta and cosine theta, right? The perfect square between this guy, adding them together equals to one. So that's kind of like a, a intrinsic nature for sine and the cosine, regardless what the value is of theta, right? So that being said, we like to give this intrinsic property between different trigonometries, sine, cosine, tangent, and so on and so forth. So this kind of relationship, we give a name, identity. So sine square theta plus cosine square theta equals to one. This is actually one identity of all the trigonometries. There are, ton, there are tons of identities, but this is actually the most straightforward one, right? The most easy one of them. So that being said, we kind of have an idea that, okay, trigonometry is defined in a right triangle, okay? And the definition, there's nothing to say, right? We just have all those definitions. But because everything was defined in a right triangle, 
So therefore, there must be some internal relationship between the sizes, aka there might be some in relationship between all the trigonometries. And we actually give a name of such a relationship, identity. There are tons of identities we're going to talk about it in our upcoming lectures. But generally speaking, I think this is the thinking process, right? Why we want to have such a concept, why this concept is raised. So there's a reasoning behind it. Okay, I think these are kind of the basic, basic foundations. So after this, let me go back to another question. Now, I think we're all on the same page. All the trigonometries is defined in a right triangle, and we have kind of a relationship between the trigonometries. However, based on the way we give this definition, we see there's a lot of constraints. Let's say we must do our discussion in a right triangle. Okay, right triangle means what? Right, so right triangle means what? You have two angles, theta one, theta two, this is 90 degree, theta one plus theta two equals to 90 degrees, right? This is means right triangle. So that being said, if you wanna talk about theta one, theta two, they can't be too big. They can, the maximum they go is like 90 degrees, right? Even though you wanna take this right triangle here, this is 90 degrees. But what about, I wanna see some larger angles, right? Some larger angles. Let's say if I have a, like a obtuse triangle, right? I might have something greater than 90 degrees, but lesser than 180 degrees. Let's say phi, right? Well, so that being said means all those right triangle related definition is too limited, right? It is quite possible in our real life we can see angles more than 90 degrees. Let's say here, right? In our obtuse, obtuse triangle, we wanna see something bigger. Is there any way for me to kind of define my trigonometry in a more flexible way, more flexible way, such that I won't be squeezed into 90 degrees-ish? So this is actually a very common, very intuitive answer, right? Very intuitive question. So this is actually how our mathematician doing our work. We always start with something easy, something understandable, and then we want to make it more generic. If we want to generalize our discussion, how can we do something not only 90 degrees, not only lesser than 90 degrees, I want something bigger. So that being said, we're going to go to our step number two. We want to find the generalized definition of trigonometry. We want something more generic, not only just 90 degrees. So in order to basically make a more generic definition, we have to introduce a concept of a unit circle. So what is a unit circle? Unit circle means a circle, and I want to have my radius equals to one, which is quite understandable, right? So this is my unit circle, okay? As long as I have a unit circle, let's say I try to find a point on my unit circle. So this point A might have basically two coordinates, which makes sense, right? And also if I do a connection, this is gonna be my unit circle OA, OA equals to one, right? But I can just put an R, that's, that's not a big deal whatsoever. Okay, if that's the case, we're basically having a unit circle, we have a point. So that being said, if I wanna say OA and the positive direction of X axis, you're gonna see a theta value here, right? Which makes sense, right? There's a theta value here. How can I use the theta value help me to define something similar as I did for this right triangle previously, right? This is more specific definition, the right triangle, but now I go to a unit circle. Can I do something exactly the same or something quite similar? The answer is yes. We can actually redefine all the trigonometry we talk about in the right triangle Let's try to redefine everything into this unit circle. Let's follow me. Let's have a quick look. How are we going to do such a definition? So in this unit circle, I can define, again, this is the definition. 
there is no way to fight. Sine theta equals to y over r. Okay, y. What is y? Y is the is the y coordinate, right? The y coordinate of a. Cosine theta is x over r. X is coordinate of a over r. R is kind of the kind of the radius. And tangent theta. Tangent theta is y over x. Again, these are just definition, nothing really special. And like I said, these are the three most important trigonometries. And if I take the reciprocal, I will take three not that much important trigonometries. But still, I'm going to write it here. Cosecant theta is the reciprocal of sine r over y. Secant theta, reciprocal of cosine r over x. And cotangent theta is the reciprocal of tangent x over y. Again, this is definition, right? Nothing really special. It's a definition. OK, now you are trying to define the same thing we defined before. So these two definitions, they must be harmonic. You can't have like these two definitions fighting with each other, right? So let's have a quick look. What is x? What is y? So if I want to make a quick perpendicular line to the x-axis, so this is going to be your y, right? And this is going to be our x. Theta, theta is here. So let's have a quick discussion to see if everything is harmonic. Because as long as you have a perpendicular line, you will automatically have a right triangle, which is good, right? Right triangle is exactly what we did in our previous definition. So sine theta is y over x, the opposite, uh, y over r, excuse me, the, uh, like the opposite side over the radius. Cosine is x over r adjacent over our radius. Tangent, tangent is the opposite over the adjacent, right? And these are exactly the same thing. You just take a reciprocal. So that being said, okay, in my unit circle definition, using the x coordinate, the y coordinate, you can basically make sure our definition is exactly the same as our level one definition using the right triangle, right? So everything is harmonic. Nothing is fighting with each other. If that's the case, people are going to say, hey, Alex, if they're exactly the same, why don't we waste your time doing the second definition? You're right. For now, this is totally wasting our time. However, if I move one step forward, let's check out here. Exactly the same thing. Exactly the union circle. Because in my definition, I just want to say there's a point on the unit circle, you want to define sine, cosine, tangent, blah, 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 using the x coordinate, y coordinate. So the point can be not only in the first coordinate, they can be the second, the third, the fourth, whatever you want to do, right? So that being said, what about my point is here? x, y. So everything keeps the same, right? All the definition should, should be totally independent, independent from where your a point is. Now your A point go to your second quadrant, but all the definitions keeps exactly the same. So let's have a quick look. According to our definition, what is the angle theta mean? It means OA versus the X coordinate, the positive direction of X axis. So that being said, now my theta is here. Now I can actually have a point Reach, uh, yeah, reach is actually representing an angle which is more than 90 degrees, which makes sense, right? Using the uni circle, you can use the same thing to define an angle which is actually greater than 90 degrees. Okay, then can I do something here? Maybe I use A prime, X, Y. So that one, what is my angle? My angle is here. Oh my God, you're actually defined an angle which is more than 180 degrees. But all the definitions are exactly the same. Is that right? And we can do something like here. What about my angle? A, my point A is here, should be double prime. So what is your angle? 
your angle is again from the positive direction of x-axis all the way to OA ray, right? So that is your new theta. All your theta is more than 206, 270 degrees. So that being said, your angle can be very big, right? As long as you can make the A, B, like the A, A prime, A double prime into different quadrants, you can basically define a very large angles trigonometry value, which makes sense. Previously in your right triangle, you can never do that, right? Uh, if that's the case, people will say, regardless what you're gonna do, you're still gonna have an angle lesser than zero to 360 because the entire circle is 360 degrees. Well, you are right in the sense, but later what I'm, what, uh, what I'm gonna be showing you will basically have go help you go one step forward. In a unit circle, when you define an angle, so again, let me just try to put a thing here. In a unit circle, when you are trying to define an angle, you basically use what? Like I said, you can use, let's say here, means the included angle from the X positive direction all the way to OA ray, right? Okay, so your OA can do all the way come to here, that's it. If you do such a definition, this is 360 degrees intuitively. However, your OA ray can keep rolling. It can finish one circle and then come to here again. So that being said means your definition of your angle will be 130 degrees plus another degree. Maybe I'll put in there maybe 30 degrees. So now your angle OA will become angle equals to 360 plus 30 equals to 390 degrees. Okay, as long as you can do it once, you can actually let your OA rig keep rolling, right? Keep like rolling. You can go for one turn, two turns, three turns, and whatever turns. So that being said, as long as you go for one turn, you'll be more than 360 degrees. Let's say my OA has an angle theta from the minimum minimum theta. Every time you take a turn, they will add 360 degrees, right? You take another turn, add 360 degrees times two. You add another turn, 360 degrees times three, all the way 360 degrees times K, right? So that being said, as long as you understand the unit circle definition, you can define an angle which is actually more than 360 degrees, can be one million degree, two, two trillion degree, right? As long as you keep rotating, keep rotating, and you will be able to define your angle as big as possible. And also on top of that, even though you have a huge, huge angle after it runs, maybe it takes like 300 rounds, but eventually it will stop, right? It will never go out of your four different coordinates. Maybe after how many circles, it stops from here. You wanna to go to a B point, right? The B point is gonna have your coordinate X, Y. If I wanna ask you, so what is the sinusal value of this huge, huge angle? From the trigonometry's perspective, if you wanna put it into the right triangle, there's no way to do, right? because our right triangle cannot tolerate a huge, huge angle. However, from our unit circles perspective, I, really, I don't really care where, where you wanna start, where you wanna take, take your turns, eventually you will stop. As long as you stop, your sine theta value will be exactly equals to y over r, right? Our definition is always the same. I don't really care how many turns you take, as long as you stop, you will have a point. So tell me the X coordinate, the Y coordinate, I will define this entire thing using exactly the coordinates. So that being said, by introducing the unit circle, you would be able to define a huge triangles trigonometry, but still using the easy peasy understandable way. So that's the beauty why we like to introduce all those kind of sine, cosine thing to make our life easier. So far, so good. Just wanna have a basic, basic definition for that. Okay, one more step. 
Now you tell me that you can actually do such a turning around, right? You can do a huge triangle. You can do a huge angle. So here, I want to do another definition. Again, in trigonometry, there are many definitions you have to agree upon before we can talk about our discussions. We defined if you go for anti-clockwise, right? this way, right? This is the anti-clockwise way. We define the angle you created by rotating anti-clockwise they're positive angles. Like I said, this is 30 degrees. And if you take a one turn, this is going to be 30 degrees plus 360. But regardless, this is always, always, always going to be positive. And also we define, if you start and rotating clockwise, this theta will be negative. OK? These theta will be negative. Again, okay, this is a definition. No way around. We just try to follow this definition. So that being said, let's go for this. If I still have a unit circle, I have a theta. OK, I rotate to here 30 degrees. So I will say my theta equals to minus 30 degrees. Minus 30 degrees, which makes sense, right? But what if I want to do, go here, I take another 360 and then go back. Theta is going to be minus 30 degrees, minus 360. So you, like the more you roll, right? The more you rotate, the deeper, like, like the, what should I say? Like the absolute value of this negative guy is going to increase, but, the, but like the lesser the angle will be, right? It's 390 degrees. So if we do a quick comparison, it looks like the positive way, the negative way, they're pretty much the same thing, right? Just as long as you roll, right? As long as you rotate, so you will have positive or negative. So far, so good. I think this is very understandable. Any questions? All good? Can I have some feedbacks? All good? So far, so good? We talk about some of the definition, what the trigonometry is, you know, how we're going to define this, so on and so forth. All right, so before we move forward, we actually find out a very interesting thing as well. Let's give you another quick observation. I have a union circle here. I have a, see, two, this is Y, okay. So let's try to use your definition. A triangle is defined by, you know, basically rotating your angles, right? Okay, no problem. So that being said, let's go for something like this. The first time, I just basically go for 30 degrees. Okay, go for 30 degrees. And you, you're going to have a value A, right? X, Y. So you tell me sine 30 degrees, according to our definition is what? y over x, is it right? So that being said, you'll be able to have a value. Okay, no problem. Later, your angle is keep rotating, keep rotating, I rotating to a point, which is symmetric to A, A prime, minus x, positive y, right? So these two angles, A and A prime, they're symmetric to each other, right? So what is going to be this? This is going to be 150 degrees, right? Because everything is symmetric. This is also 30. So entirely speaking, you are, you're, you're going to have the 150 degrees for the blue angle. So sine 150 degrees also equals to y over y or r, right? Not, not y or x, y over r. So far, so good? There's nothing tricky, right? It's very understandable. So that being said, you have a very, very interesting sine 30 degrees. Actually, it's the same as a sine 150 degrees. OK, so far, so good? OK, so again, 
if my angle goes to here, I take 360 degrees and go back to here. So my new point, A double prime, will be superpositioning as the A, right? At the very beginning, A. So you're gonna find sine 360 plus 30 degrees actually also equals Y or R. It makes sense, right? You always keep the same point. Okay. So that really gives you an idea. It looks like sine 30 degrees, sine 150 degrees, sine 390 degrees. They basically have the same value, the same sinusoidal value, right? We just use sine as an example. Cosine, tangent, everything is different, but let's just use the sine. So that really gives me the feeling, you see, sine 30 degrees equals to sine 150 degrees, I can write as 180 degrees minus 30 degrees, right? This is not a magic, right? Also equals to sine 306 degrees plus 30 degrees. And also you can find out that this one is not only just work for 30 degrees. If I change the 30 degrees into, I don't know, 40 degrees, 45 degrees, uh, 60 degrees, so on and so forth, or everything will keep the same, right? So that means that maybe I can generic the 30 degrees into something like maybe theta, theta, theta. So I have sine theta equals to sine 180 degrees minus theta, also equals to 360 degrees plus theta, right? We just use a very easy piece of example and we get pretty much everything like this. And trust me, this is actually a very important observation. Looks like you are trying to do some angle manipulation. You change some angle, adding something, subtract something. Maybe you can keep the original sinus value keeps the same. Right? The sinus value won't be changed if you do some certain kind of angle manipulation. And this is actually the prototype of our trigonometry co-function. Trigonometry co-function is kind of like a methodology which helps you to build up the relationship between very various angles. So you might have a very easy angle, an acute angle, 30 degrees, you might have an obtuse angle, you might have a gigantic angle. But nevertheless, there are kind of some rules build up the relationship between all those angles. And also at the end of the day, even though I give you a huge angle, I don't know, I just wanna give an example. Maybe this is like a huge angle. You can always try to use some methodology, so on and so forth, help you to convert this huge angle into a relatively easy angle, right? So this process is actually by the help of using our co-function. It really helps you to reduce the complexity from a nasty angle into some easy angle, so on and so forth. So that's actually another very important topic we're gonna to cover for our following lectures. That's the co-function. There are tons of co-functions and we need to consolidate them into an easy, easy, understandable rule. So far, so good? I think these are very easy, easy understanding because trigonometry might not be very familiar to every one of you. So I'm here just trying to slow down my speed a little bit, try to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay, if all good, let's continue. So now we already have some basic, basic definition of trigonometry. And we can actually do a little bit more for more, trigon more trigonometries one by one. Let's have a quick look. The first one is our sine theta, right? Sine theta. According to our definition, our sine theta is always be something like this. You're gonna find a point A, X, Y, Sine theta is defined as y over r, right? Okay, let's have a quick look. Y over r. Y is what? Y is the, if we want to put them into a right triangle, y is what? Y is one of the 
right leg. And R, R is the hypotenuse. And normally speaking, Y is always lesser than R, right? Normally speaking, Y is always lesser than R. But as your A point is closer, closer, all the way, as long as A point is here, this is going to be zero R, right? So your Y point will become the R point. So that being said, as long as this is 90 degrees, you're going to find out the sign 90 degrees equals to one, which makes sense, right? Okay, as long as your A point comes to here, okay, your Y will become lesser than R. All the way, all the way, when you come to here, sign 180 degrees will be equal to zero, right? Will be equal to zero. Because by the time then, y will degrade into zero. This is going to be your r, zero. Very understandable, right? And then moving forward, as long as you come to here, let's have a look. You're still going to use a sine theta equals to y over r. r is actually a positive number. It's, that's the distance. But at this moment, you are a double prime your y will be lesser than zero, is it right? So that being said, your sine theta value will be lesser than zero, which makes sense, right? At the very beginning, your sine theta value is greater than zero. But as long as you pass the x-axis, you go to more than 180 degrees, you are gonna be lesser than zero. So that being said, as long as the theta is more than 180 degrees, lesser than 360 degrees. As long as your point is in the, in the uh, like, uh, like the underneath part, right? Like the lower part of your x-axis, you're gonna have your sine theta value lesser than zero. All the way you come to here, let me change the color. A, zero R, zero minus R, your sine 270 degree will be equals to minus one, right? These are very understandable definition. So that being said, you can find out for sine theta, it's always gonna be the value from minus one to positive one. Is it right? Sine theta value is gonna be always a value between negative one to positive one, right? And as long as it hit 90 degrees, 270 degrees, it's gonna have your minus one and a positive one, right? negative one and positive one. This is what, 270 degree, this is 90 degree. But most of the time, your sinus of value, is gonna be a value between negative one and positive one, which makes sense. So far, so good? Okay. And we can do the same thing for cosine. Let's have a quick look. For cosine theta, I think that's pretty much the same thing, right? If you have an angle theta, this is your a, x, y, cosine theta is defined your x over r, your x over r. x, where is x? x is here, right? So that being said means what? As long as your x is closer, as, as long as your x is closer to r, your cosine theta is gonna be closer to one. Right? When theta equals to zero degrees, cosine theta equals to one. Because by the time then A is here, your Y equals to zero, your X equals to R, right? That's gonna be your one. As long as your A becomes to here, theta equals to 90 degrees, your cosine theta is gonna become to zero. Because by the time then your X axis goes to zero, R, and this is your R, right? And theta is same thing. You can try to do the same thing. What about your cosine theta is equal to 180 degrees? Theta equals to 270 degrees. Theta equals to 360 degrees. You put out all the information together. Let's put it here. Whenever A is becomes to here, your cosine theta is going to be equal to minus one, right? By the time then, that's going to be minus R zero. Theta comes to here your cosine theta equals to zero, and then your cosine theta equals to one. 
right? These are basic, basic definition. So that being said, you can actually find out cosine theta is also from positive one to negative one. Okay? This is also very understandable stuff. And what about tangent to theta, right? We're gonna talk, talk about everything one by one. What about tangent to theta? Tangent to theta, let's do exactly the same thing. Tangent to theta, according to our definition, equals to what? Y over X. Okay, let's check it out. Whenever your A is here, X is equal to R, Y is equal to zero. Is that right? So therefore, tangent at zero degrees will equal to zero. Makes sense, right? But as long as, as long as your theta value is become bigger when it is when it is approaching ninety degrees, now you're always gonna use your y over x. Your at y is becoming bigger, bigger, but y all the way like the biggest y can get is actually r, right? However, your x is become smaller, smaller, smaller. So that being said, whenever tangent is equal to 90 degrees, this one is gonna go to infinity, right? Why? Because that's gonna be your y over x, y becomes r, but x will become zero. So that being said, in our high school definition, of course, you do not wanna your denominator becomes to zero. So that being said, Whenever x equals to 90 degrees, your tangent theta becomes not definable, right? In that case, your x is gonna become zero, which is not what we need. All right. So that being said, from zero degree to 90 degree, the tangent theta value is from zero, which you can touch, all the way into infinity, all right? Because you won't be able to touch infinity. So that being said, when we try to define tangent to theta, maybe I have to skip x equals to 90 degrees because 90 degrees, there's no definition to it, which is quite understandable, right? Okay, can we do the same thing? As long as we go to the negative part, Let's go to the second. Let's go to the second quadrant. I'm gonna have an A here, X, Y. If I wanna do my definition, tangent theta, Y over X, check it out. Y at this moment is positive, but X at this moment will be negative, right? So that being said, as long as you pass 90 degrees, tangent theta will become negative. Is that right? All the way, whenever you comes to here, this is gonna be your minus R zero, your tangent 180 degrees will become what? Zero as well. Ah, so that being said, for the tangent of theta from zero, let me change a different color, from zero to 90 degrees, you basically jump from zero all the way to infinity. And also you're gonna reduce our value, right? From here all the way to zero. And also you're gonna increase, you're gonna decrease, something like that. So that being said, tangent to theta, if you wanna give the entire range of the tangent to theta, it's actually from negative infinity to positive infinity, right? Why? Because the moment you step to here, okay? If you wanna do the y over x, your y is actually a positive guy, but right, very close to r. But your x is gonna be a negative guy very close to zero, right? So that being said, if you're very close to 90 degrees, from the left-hand side, tangent theta will be close to positive infinity. From the negative side, tangent x will go to the negative infinity. And this guy is gonna go all the way to zero, right? This is kind of like an idea how tangent x is changing their values. You don't have to basically know too much because later, whenever we go to the trigonometry functions, 
we will give how this trigonometry, how this tangent x looks like for this entire thing. All right, I think generally speaking, that's what I want to say for the trigonometry identity, uh, for the trigonometry basics. So what are you gonna do? You just try to use the definition of trigonometry. The trigonometry's definition is very straightforward, right? You just try to use this, everything we find here, here. This is our definition, right? You use this definition, try to find out what are the relationship between the sine, cosine, tangent, you know, so on and so forth. Okay. So moving forward, before we jump to all the problems, so I want to say one thing is that for our trigonometry identities perspective, I mean, for, from our trigonometry basics perspective, we're not really asking you guys to remember a lot of complicated flowery trigonometry formulas, but there are some basic, basic, basic things you need to remember. So, like I said, the first one is sine square theta plus cosine square theta equals to one, which is quite understandable, right? You get this value from the definition of our trigonometry. The second is this, again, theta. This is A, this is B, this is C. Let's see, sine theta equals to A over C, right? Cosine theta equals to B over C. What if I wanna do a division between these two? Sine theta over cosine theta, that one will be A over B, is it right? And the A over B is actually what? Our tangent theta. So here you need to remember a second very important thing. Tangent theta equals to sine theta over cosine theta, right? So I think generally speaking from our trigonometry basics perspective, as long as you remember this basic, basic relationship, these are basic from the definition and you will be able to I'll say okay for most of the trigonometry basic related problems. Okay, so we're gonna stop our knowledge from here for a sec. So let me do a quick survey. So based on what I just explained for the trigonometry basics, uh, what do you guys think? It is like too easy, too slow, or it is fair? Because every time our student is different, I like to ask you guys what your feedback and I will be able to adjust our speed based on our feedback. Can I ask every single student to give me a quick feedback? You know what? I'm gonna launch a quick poll, okay? So I'm gonna launch the poll here. Please, everyone participate and give me the poll. Give me a result. Is it too easy? Is it like, yeah, you can let me know because I would always adjust our speed based on your feedback. So I'm gonna, and the poll, I'm going to launch it, share the results. Okay, as you can see, uh, roughly 80% of the students think it is fair, and 20% of the students think it is too easy. So no problem, because I can do super fast, no problem, if you go to our advanced lectures, but I can also do very, very slow, but I have to understand where you stand. Okay, no problem, I will base on your, I will basically adjust our lectures based on your feedback. So let's go for some problems, okay? If you think it's very easy, just let me know because many students, they have a very limited knowledge about the trigonometry. So that's the reason I do not like to go super fast at the very beginning. So let's go for some real problems. Question number one, we're gonna see a problem. This is a very old problem, 1988, American high school, Mass exam. This is the so previously our AMC was actually named American High School Mass Exam. So this is basically we changed the name to AMC only recently. So this is question number 13. So let's have a quick look. This is the direct definition of our sine cosine trigonometry basics. If sine theta equals to three cosine theta, then what's the value for sine theta times cosine theta? if the value for sine theta is twice of the cosine theta. So what is the value for sine theta times cosine theta? 
So before we get started, our lecturer always like to give you some conditional react, conditional react. As long as you see sine theta and cosine theta together, it can be more complicated. Maybe sine theta plus three cosine theta equals to, I don't know, maybe it's sine square theta plus cosine four cosine square theta, so on and so forth, okay? Normally speaking, as long as you see sine theta and the cosine theta together, your first reaction is try to convert sine theta, cosine theta into tangent theta. This is a conditional react. So like we keep saying, we're gonna teach you guys a bunch of conditional react for the entire course of our lecture and make sure everyone can understand it, can basically utilize it on the fly. So as long as you see sine and cosine need to convert it into tangent. So let's have a look. Sine theta equals to three cosine theta. So how can I convert into tangent? Of course, I wanna divide cosine theta on the two sides of this equation. So tangent theta will be equals to three. Is it easy? Easy peasy, right? Let me give you another thing. Sine square theta, three sine theta, cosine theta plus four cosine squared equals to maybe equals to zero. What can I do as long as I see this? Who can tell me? So this is what I show you, right? Sine equals to three cosine. Who can tell me if I see an equation like this, what can you do? You can basically chat with me in the group chat or you can unmute yourself and directly talk to me. Somebody mentioned the Siemens fact, favorite factorization trick. Um, maybe not necessarily that much. SFFT, not that necessarily that much. Can you do something exactly like I mentioned? I said, as long as you see sine and cosine converted into tangent, who can tell me using the same, pra the same practice, what can I do for my blue equation? Somebody mentioned, use the first sine plus cosine, sine square plus the cosine square equals to one and the convert the midterm to tangent. Uh, so let's follow that. If you say you wanna use the first one equals to one, so that's gonna be what? Sine theta square plus cosine square, right? Plus three sine x cosine x plus three cosine square x, right? Equals to, so that one will be one. The following part, how can you convert all of them into tangent? I don't think that's a good idea neither. What else? What kind of strategy you can use in order to convert? Somebody mentioned using the sum of one, that's exactly the same thing, right? The sum of one, because this is only one term, these are four terms, right? So you won't be able to directly squeeze all of them into four. You can only have one, right? This is one. The remaining will be three sine plus three cosine square, but you won't be able to finish or to basically simplify your work too much. Right? Is there any other powerful way for you to convert it into just tangent? You see, this is the learning process, right? We always give you something easy and then we give you a rule or like a methodology. So moving forward, you need to jump from something easy into something not that much easy. Who else can think about? We use exactly the same strategy. We can also convert this guy into just tangent. What can I do? Doing some observation and you will be able to take them out. Yes. So let me ask Yvette to give us some ideas. If you divide everything by cosine squared x, then the sine squared x becomes sine over cosine squared, and the three sine x over cosine x b 
becomes three times sine x over cosine x and everything becomes tan. Is that right? So this guy is exactly the same thing. You just have to divide cosine square x. So that's gonna be sine square over cosine square plus three sine over cosine plus four equals to zero, right? So sine square over cosine, this is gonna be our tangent square, right? Plus three tangent plus four equals to zero. Is it right? So you will be able to find the value for tangent one, tangent two. One is three, one is, one is minus three, one is minus one. Tangent theta, you can choose whatever value you wanna choose. So you will be able to still get the value for tangent to theta. Exactly the same thing as here. Is it right? So bear in mind, this is exactly what we mentioned. As long as in the future, if you see equation is only sine, cosine, blah, 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 your first reaction is need to convert it into tangent. Sometimes you just have to do a quick conversion. Sometimes you just do a little bit more complicated, but you're gonna convert it into the quadratic equation of tangent. But nevertheless, the strategies are exactly the same, convert, convert them into tangent. So far so good? Okay, this is only a side talk, okay? Let's go, let's go back to here. Now, the question gives you a sine and the cosine, you have a such a relationship. And the question asks you, what's the value for sine times cosine? So, because this is what? This is a multiple choice question, right? As long as you have the correct answer, you're good to go. You have already got tangent equals to three. And you want to define what is the sine, what is the cosine? The most straightforward way is you can actually create a triangle. So this triangle, you can construct something with tangent theta equals to three. So this is three, this is one, right? As long as you have three, you have one, then you will be able to create a tangent theta. So what is our hypotenuse? This is gonna be your root 10, is it right? As long as you have all the sizes, can you do sine? Sine is what? Three over root 10. What is cosine? Cosine is one over root 10. So what's the value of the result? Three over 10. That's it. Fairly understandable, right? So the trick for this problem tells us that as long as you see sine and cosine, convert it into tangent. As long as you see tangent, the question asks you to do some calculation. Don't waste, waste your time. Directly construct a triangle, and from the triangle, you will be able to have the value. So far, so good? Mm -hmm. So far, so good? Perfect. If all good, let's go to our second problem. Second problem is let A is acute triangle acute angle, sine A plus cosine A equals to five over seven. Please determine the values of the following two expressions. Sine A times cosine A. Second expression, tangent A plus cotangent A. Let's have a quick discussion. The question gives you an acute triangle. Okay. This acute triangle has sine A plus cosine A equals to seven over five. Okay. With all those information, you need to determine what is sine A times cosine A what is the tangent A plus cotangent A? All right, so let's have a quick, quick discussion. Whenever you have, let's change a different color. Now the question gives you sine A plus cosine A equals to seven over five. 
you want to find something like a sine, a times cosine. Who can tell me what kind of the what kind of formulas you have already learned? You can find out what kind of relationship between x plus y to x times y. What is the relationship you can find out? So maybe we're gonna ask, uh, maybe we're gonna ask uh, Thomas to give us some ideas. Um, does my mic even work? Yeah, I think your solution is correct. So that's the reason I ask you. Oh, um, uh, since sine is um, the opposite of the hypotenuse and cosine is the adjacent over hypotenuse. Uh, sine plus cosine would be just the opposite plus the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Mm -hmm. And um, seven, if, if the hypotenuse is five, then it's pretty obvious that seven is just three plus four. So it would be a three, four, five Pythagorean triple. Yeah, I think that's actually a very smart solution because we know it's fine, cosine, they're actually defined in the right triangle, right? Like 90, like 90 degree triangle. As long as you see seven over five. So seven over five and two things you can actually guess. Maybe this is a three, this is a four, this is a five. So sine x will be equals to what? Four over five. Cosine x equals to three over five. So sine x plus cosine x just equals to seven over five. And then you will be able to directly using sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, put them together and find out a value. Is that right? Especially when you're dealing with the AMC because AMC does not really ask you to give you the solution process. You just have to guess. As long as you guess out the correct answer, even though you throw a dice, no problem. All the way go to Amy, that's it if you have a magic dice, right? So that's actually a very good solution. And we really promote our students try to find out some shortcut solution, especially in the AMC. Okay, solution number one, we already have. We got a solution from Thomas. Let's go to our solution number two. Let's try to do something more rigorous. Hopefully we can rigorously solve the problem. Instead of like guessing or something, we need to find out a relationship between sine cos sine plus cosine or x plus y between x times y or sine times cosine. So that being said, actually give us another very important conditional react. Every single problem, we just wanna teach you a conditional react in trigonometry. Our second conditional react is as long as you see sine a, plus cosine a. The question asks you to do sine a times cosine. There might be some coefficient, I don't know. The most straightforward way is try to do a perfect square. This is a conditional react. We just introduced conditional react for the tangent. This is the second conditional react. As long as you see all those conditional react, I, I'll actually keep telling you one by one, you will be able to get a hang of it and you can solve some difficult problems. So let's have a look. Sine A plus cosine A equals to seven over five. Let's do perfect square. Sine square A, cosine square A, two sine A, cosine A equals to 49.25, right? But like I told you, there are only two things I want you to remember for this trigonometry basics. One is sine A plus cosine A equals one. The other way is sine A over cosine A equals to tangent. So that one will be equals to one. So therefore, sine A times cosine A will be equals to 12 over 25. That's it, so easy, right? Even though it is easy, try to remember, this is extremely important. As long as you see sine A over, sine A plus cosine A, your conditional react is, if you do perfect square, 
you would automatically generate sine square plus cosine square. And this guy is going to help you to convert into one, and you will find out the value for sine A times cosine A. So far, so good. Okay, try to remember. Again, like I said, as long as you accumulate more and more conditional reacts, you will be able to see all those weird trigonometry identity problems. There is a reasoning. Not everything is directly from the inspiration. There are a lot of things you can follow, but you can't have that in one day, right? You need to gradually by gradually build up all those conditional react. All good. If all good, let's go to our second problem. Tangent A plus cotangent A. Tangent A plus cotangent A. Who can tell me how can I do this? With the sine A plus cosine A equals to seven over five, how can I get tangent A plus cotangent A? Who can think about it? Give me maybe 30 seconds, think about it. Every single problem, I like to introduce a new strategy, a new common sense. A student said, is it not just a one? And uh, why do you get one? No, it is not one. But you can show your thinking process maybe. Tangent A plus cotangent A is not equal to one. Tangent A times cotangent A equals to one, because they are reciprocal, right? Yes, I think I, I, I understand where you come from. Yeah, I understand where you come from. How can I do this, right? Okay, so let's, every, so let's follow our strategy, follow our strategy. So question give you sine A plus cosine A equals to what? seven over five. Question ask you tangent A plus cotangent A equals what, right? Uh, previously, we actually introduced something. If you see sine A and cosine A, maybe you can try to convert into tangent A. Do you still remember? Sine A and cosine A, try to convert into tangent A. However, by the time then, I gave you something like this, maybe three sine A, plus four cosine A equals to zero. If you divide cosine A on the two sides of this equation, three sine A cosine A plus four equals to zero, right? So three tangent A equals to minus four. Then tangent A equals to minus four or three, right? Okay, if we follow whatever we just introduced, right? You have this, and then you can plug it to calculate. However, the nasty part is for this problem, here is not zero. Here is a seven over five. If you wanna do the same thing, let's follow me, right? I'm gonna divide cosine A on the two sides of this equation. You're gonna have tangent A, plus cosine A equals to seven, five, cosine A. Uh, I, I just can't do it, right? Because previously, if here is a zero, that's perfect. But now here is not zero, here's like seven over five. Maybe I just can't do that, right? This is very understandable. Okay. 
and the question asks you to do cotangent A and tangent A. How can I do that? This is going to go to our conditional react number three. Sometimes you try it, you want to convert sine A, cosine A into tangent A, it doesn't work. There's a second strategy, convert tangent A into sine A over cosine A. This is back and forth, right? Sometimes you convert from sine A, cosine A to tangent, but sometimes you need to do the other way around. You want to convert tangent A into sine A over cosine A. This is totally the other way around, but it is also a very important conditional react. So let's have a look. How can we do this? Tangent A plus cotangent A equals to what? Like I said, I can't do sine, cosine, go to tangent. I want to do the other way around. Tangent go to sine over cosine. Tangent is sine cosine. Cotangent is cosine, sine. Okay, no problem. Let's keep doing this. Let's try to, try to like uh, make sure that I have the same denominator, right? Sine, cosine, sine square, cosine square. Is that right? So that one equals what? I keep using whatever we introduced today, right? This is one. Sine A, cosine A. Hey, sine A, cosine, this is exactly what we introduced, what we calculate in our step number one, right? Whenever the question has multiple steps, maybe you try to use whatever you calculate for the first step and then apply it into the second one. What is sine over cosine? 12 over 25. So the answer is 25 over 12. Is that right? Easy peasy, right? So that actually gives us another very important hint that in the future, when you try to make sine A, cosine A, and the tangent A, cotangent A, there are two major directions. You can try to our conditional number one. Jane, let me change the color. You can try to convert. sine, cosine into tangent. This is your number one approach. If that one doesn't work, then you need to convert tangent into sine over cosine. So two way around, these will be able to help you understand what's the relationship between the two and then hopefully get answer calculated. So always you wanna play with these two things, convert sine, cosine into tangent or convert tangent into sine cosine and taking from there you will be able to solve the problem so far so good perfect if all good let's continue so i think all the way to now we just basically have a very basic basic understanding for our trigonometry sine cosine tangent and how to define them in the triangle how to put them into unicircle so on so forth and actually, in order to use our trigonometry, we're not only using them in this weird calculation. You give me some weird formula, I just need to do the calculation. Trigonometry actually has a lot of real applications. And one of the very good applications is that's going to help you to solve you some 2D geometry problems. Trigonometry can really help you to solve some 2D geometry problems. And as long as you know those guys, that's going to be very helpful. Okay, those kind of approaches, that's going to be very helpful for a 2D geometry problem solving process. So how can I use our trigonometry to solve the 2D geometry problems? Normally speaking, you need two very important tools. So that's our, actually our the third one. We're going to talk about trigonometry solve 2D geometry problem. But you really can't solve the problem right away. You have to learn some tools in order to help you solve the problem. So AKA, we're gonna talk about the law of sine and the law 
of cosine. We talk about sine, we talk about cosine, right? Now we're gonna talk about the law of sine, law of cosine. That's actually very important two things help us to solve 2D geometry problems. So before we get started, I, I need to go for another very quick, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna go for another very quick survey. Have you heard about the sine law or the cosine law? I launched a problem. So one is yes, one is no, you can let me know. Have you guys heard about sine law, cosine law? Okay, perfect. I'm gonna show you. So everyone, please, please everyone participate and let me know. Have you already heard, heard about sine law and cosine law? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. I'm gonna share the result. See, again, we have roughly 80% say yes, 20% say no. So let's do a very, very, very quick recap, okay? So what is a sine law? Let's get started with a sine law. Sine law goes like this. If I have a triangle, A, B, C, this is A, this is B, this is C, it does not have to be a right triangle, any kind of triangle, then automatically you will have sine A over A, uh, A over sine A, excuse me, A over sine A, B over sine B, C over sine C equals to 2R. Let me see that one more time. So what is the sine law? Sine law says any given triangle, A over sine A, sine is the opposite angle, right? I take a sine value. A over sine A equals to B over sine B equals to C over sine C equals 2R. What is 2R? 2R is actually the radius of the circumcircle of this triangle. The radius of the circumcircle of this triangle. Right? This is R. The radius of the circumcircle of this triangle. Well, how can I prove it, All right? How can I prove it? And in order to prove this, this is actually something very easy. Let's have a quick look. I just wanna add a quick auxiliary line and we're good to go. From here, this is the circle center, right? I'm gonna make a perpendicular line to my BC chord, to my BC chord. As long as, oh, let's say this is O, right? O is the center of the triangle. And OD, let's give it a name. OD is perpendicular to BC, then you will automatically have BD equals to half of A, right? This is A, this is half of A. Everyone knows that, right? This is fairly easy, right? Like a, from the circle center, you make a perpendicular line to a chord, that, circle, that perpendicular line is going to be cutting this chord into two, two equal parts. So let's have a quick look. If this guy is a theta, this guy is also theta, is it right? Do you guys follow me? Yes or no? We just need a quick, quick knowledge from our circle part. If this guy is theta, this guy is actually the inscribed circle facing to the arc, right? And this guy, this guy is the center circle facing half of the arc, right? So that being said, you would have angle A is equal to angle B O D equals to theta. Is it right? Can I have some feedbacks? Do you guys follow me? Yes or no? Can I have some feedbacks? Yes or no? The other students? Okay, a student said no. They don't understand. Okay, no problem. Don't understand me. I'll let you know. So let's step back one. If I do a quick connection between here and here, let me ask you a thing. This angle, the yellow angle, and the this yellow angle, and let's say this green angle. Okay, let's let's try to use two color. 
I will say the yellow angle, angle yellow, oh my God, just cannot change the color, okay. Angle yellow is actually twice of angle green, is it right? Can you understand this? Angle yellow is twice angle green. A student asked me, is the A the diameter? No, A is not a diameter. A is the side, one side of your triangle. A is one side of your triangle. The diameter of the circle is 2R. The diameter of the circle is 2R, right? BC is like one side of your triangle. Okay, so far so good? So first thing first, people, you will understand the yellow angle will be twice of the green angle. Is that right? Is it understandable? Yellow angle is twice of the green angle. Okay, if you understand this, whenever you make this perpendicular line, this part is gonna be half of your yellow angle. Is that right? If this, is half your of an angle, yellow angle. So therefore, of course, your angle BOD is gonna be the same as angle A, is the same as angle green. Quite understandable, right? If you do not understand, let me know, I'll be able to help you out. Okay, with all those information, let's have a quick look at it. What is our sine value mean? Let's try to do this in our green triangle here. This is, a this is a right triangle, right? This is a right triangle. So according to our definition, sine theta will be equals to this guy over this guy. This guy is A over two, and this guy is R. Is that right? BD is A over two, BO is R. So sine theta equals to A over two times R. So therefore, sine theta A over sine theta will be equals to two R. Is that right? A over sine theta will be equals to two R. What is a sine theta? Sine theta is sine A, right? So therefore, A over sine A equals to 2R, okay? If you do the same thing for A over sine A, this is A, let me change the color. This is A over, this is like a, a over sine A. You can do the same thing for B over sine B and C over sine C, right? Everything will be equals to 2R. So A over sine A, or B over sine B, C over sine C. They will be equals to 2R. Is that right? This is quite understandable, right? This is actually the famous sine law. As long as you know a triangle, you can automatically find out a such a relationship. What is the relationship? A reaches the side over sine A, which is the opposite angle of sinusoidal value, will be the same for B over sine B, C over sine C, and all of them equals to 2R. 2R is the radius of the circumcircle. Is it understandable? Trust me, this is actually a very important rule for you to remember. All right. As long as you remember this, I want to give you a side note. A quick, very quick side note. As long as you know the definition of sine, it can always help you to calculate. It can always generate a very easy formula for you to calculate the area of a triangle. Give an example. Let's say I have a triangle. This is A, this is B, this is C. Let's say, this is your A, uh, this is your, oops. This is your A, right? This is your B, this is your C, right? 
Let's say I want to ask you, what is the area of my triangle ABC? The area of my triangle ABC. Okay, or you can use this, right? Same thing. The area of triangle ABC, you can actually find a very easy way to say that. It can be written as one over two A times B sine C. One over two A times B sine C. Why? It's very easy. Let's try to do a perpendicular line here. What is my trigonometry's area? My trigonometry's area is one over two H times B, right? The bottom times the height, like the height. But what is H? H just equals to A times sine C. Is it right? A times sine C. Because what? Because sine C equals to H times A. You use A here, A, A can be canceled, right? So H directly equals to H. So therefore, one over two H A sine C times B, right? So that's gonna be one over two AB sine C. So what does it mean? A triangle's area can be right, uh, can be written as the product of two sizes times the included angles sine value and then divided by two. The product of two sizes times the sine value of the included angle and divided by two. We can actually do the same thing. You, now you do A, B, sine C. The next one, you can do the same thing, B, C, sine A, right? And you can do the same thing. Let me change the color to red, A, C, sine B. Trust me, this is actually a very important formula. And using this formula, that's gonna help you do a lot of, a lot of interesting problems. So far, so good. Okay, this is not a magic, right? It's very understandable. So this is actually the sign law we like to talk about it. We talk about a sign law, and also we have a quick side note. All right, as long as you know the sine value, you'll be able to determine the area of a given triangle. Okay, if all good, let's go to the second one. We talk about the sine law, let's talk about the cosine law. To be honest, in our American, North American mass competition, the time you use sine law, I think it's only 30% to 20%. Not too much chance you're gonna use the sine law. Sine law is kind of like, not so widely applied. Well, you will definitely have 70% of 80% opportunities to use the upcoming cosine law. Cosine law is way, way, way more important compared with the sine law. And we really need to put some time for the cosine law. So second part, we're gonna talk about cosine law or law of cosine, it's up to you. So. What is law of cosine? Also, this is something like this. You have a triangle, A, B, C, A, B, C, right? Previously, I told you A over sine A equals to B over sine B equals C to over sine C, so on and so forth, right? Now I'm gonna tell you something even more interesting. I can just use the three sizes A, B, C, and I can find a value for cosine B, cosine C, and cosine A. So think about it. When we were in right triangle, of course, you give me A, you give me B, you give me C, then cosine A can be A over C, right? So on and so forth. Everything will be so easy, right? But now if I come to a regular triangle, this is not a right triangle, can I still easily determine the value for A, cosine A, sine A, cosine B, sine B? so on and so forth, right? That's actually one of the questions we like to figure out. So the cosine law can tell you, actually you can easily determine the value for cosine ABC simply using three sizes, simply using three sizes. 
So what is cosine A? Cosine A equals to B square plus C square minus A square to BC. Cosine B equals to A square C square B square to AC. Cosine C equals to A square plus B square minus C square to AB. Okay. So this is actually tells you that as long as you know the three sizes of a triangle, uh, you will be able to determine the triangles cos like the angles cosine value right away by using the combination of the three sizes. By using the combination of the three sizes. But the cosine law looks like a little bit difficult to remember, right? You have a square, b square, c square, and they look like so same. Is there any way for you, a shortcut way for you to remember what is the value for the cosine law? You can use a very quick way. You never get what you want. So this is the way how I remember the cosine law. I'll show you why. Let's say when you are dealing with cosine A, in the numerator, you're going to have B square, C square, and then minus A square. You want to determine A, you have to minus A square. And then as long as you go to the denominator, there's no A. As long as you want to determine the value for cosine B, you have to subtract B square and then in the numerator denominator, there's no B. As long as you want to determine cosine C, you have to subtract the C square and in the denominator, there's no C. You see, this is actually something very interesting, right? So that being said, means what? Ah, oh, it means you never get what you want. If you want A, there's no A. No A in the denominator, no A in the numerator. Want a B? No B for the numerator, no B for the denominator. You want to see? Same thing. I think this is actually a very easy way for you to remember the cosine law. So far, so good? Okay. Trust me, cosine law is like so important and they like to test it from time to time. Every single year, they like to test the cosine law. Okay, try to have a good understanding for the cosine law is actually extremely important for AMC exam. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know what? So the proving process, how to prove it? Proving the cosine law is not that much easy. You have to use a lot of calculations to basically find out how to do this. You can actually do some Google. You can Google cosine law proving process and you will be able to see how you can prove it. So due to the limited volume of our lecture, we won't spend too much time talking about how to prove the cosine law. Okay, you can just try to remember this as is. So far, so good. Any questions? Oh, good, right? Perfect. If all good, let's try to use the sine law, the cosine law. Let's try to solve some real problems. Hopefully, that's going to help you to solve some 2D geometry related problems. Okay, so let's go for some real problems. Question number one. So let's have a problem that comes from AMC 10. See how we're going to use them. Oops, what happened? Take photos, libraries. Okay, so that's actually. Oh, no, not this guy. There you go, yeah, that's the problem. The problem we're looking at is a problem that comes from 2010, AMC 10A, question number 19. So let's have a quick look. The problem says, Equal angular hexagon A, B, C, D, E, F. They have the side less AB equals to CD 
equals to CD uh, equals to EF equals to one. BC equals to DE equals to FA equals to R. The area of CD is 70% of the area of the entire hexagon. What is the sum of all possible values of R? Okay, so whenever you read a problem, right, there must be some key words, right? Action words, which really kind of like trigger your nerves. You want to put a lot of attention on. The first thing is why do you want to say eco angular hexagon? Is it eco angle? Eco angular hexagon means all the angles are the same, right? Literally. Is it all the angles are the same? It just means this is a like a regular hexagon, or there's not a guarantee to be a regular hexagon. So let's do this. A regular hexagon means what? All the sizes are the same. And also all the angles are the same, right? Side, angle, they must be all the same. That's how we're going to define a equal, right? Or we can say this is a regular hexagon. But the question says equal angular. It means maybe only the angles are the same, but the size are not the same. Is it possible? It is possible. Because in the triangle's perspective, triangle's perspective, If a triangle, three angles are the same, then automatically, if angles are the same, then automatically size are the same, right? Uh, uh, like a equilateral triangle, three sizes are the same, three angles are the same, and vice versa. Three sizes are the same, aka three angles can be the same. However, for polygon, starting from quadrilaterals to you know, like uh, octagon, uh, you know, the pentagon, so on and so forth. Those kind of things, angle are the same and the size are the same, are totally independent. Let's say rectangle, angles are the same, but the size are not the same. I can create a diamond shape, right? Rumbers, a diamond shape. I can make sure all the sizes are the same, but the angles are not the same. So this is very important from the hexagon, from the, you know, what kind of like polygons perspective, angles are the same and the sizes are the same. They're totally independent. They're not touching each other. So that's the reason the question says, we have a collateral, oh, we have a eco angle hexagon, A, B, C, D. So I'm just gonna write it out, B, C, right? A, B, C, D, E, F. You have all the angles are the same. However, the sizes are not the same. A, B, C, D, E, F is one. B, C, E, D, F, A is R. So let me say, this is one R, one R, one R, okay? But all the sizes, but all the angles are the same. So these angles are all the same. Okay. And what is the next condition? The next condition says the area of the triangle ACE is 70% of this entire triangle hexagon. ACE, ACE is here. The angle, the, like the area of the mid triangle takes 70% of this entire, takes 70% of this entire triangle hexagon, right? Entire hexagon. So area triangle AEC over area A, B, C, D, E, F. That is one over seven, uh, seven over 10, right? 70%, seven over 10. 
how can I determine the value for R? Let's step back a little bit. At this moment, if the black triangle takes 70%, so what is the total area of this hexagon? It's the black plus the three white triangle, right? Apparently, the three white triangles, they're congruent to each other. Why? Because you see, they both have one side equals to R, or one side equals to one, one side equals to R. And also, all the angle here is 120 degrees. 120 degrees, 120 degrees. So AKA, all of them are actually what? One over, uh, all of them are actually congruent to each other. So therefore, if we just want to take a small triangle here, so this one will take what? Only 10% of this entire area, is that right? Because everyone is congruent, the three triangles adding them together is 30%. Like the one, like the black one in the middle takes 70%. So that's going to be what? Everyone will be 10%. This guy will be 10%. This guy, 10%, 10%, this is 70%. Is that it? Okay, a student got a question. Why the angle is 120 degrees? Who can answer this question? You have a A, B, C, D, E, F. You have a Hexagon. Okay, what is the total angle sum, interior angle sum of a hexagon? What is the total interior angle sum of a hexagon? Six minus two times 180 degrees, is it right? This is total inter interior angle sum. And you want to divide it into what? You want to divide it into six because it's an equal angular. Everyone is the same. So this is going to give you 120 degrees. Is it right? So any question, just let me know, right? I'm here to help you figure out. Okay, so that answers why this is 120 degrees. So that being said, the area of my Gray AEC over the area of my ABC triangle is going to be seven over one. Is it right? The mid part takes 70%. All the three little obtuse triangles, and everyone is going to take 10%. So this is going to be seven over one. Okay. So let's do this one by one. My question, my goal is try to determine the value for R, right? I don't really care about the other stuff. How can I use R to represent everything? My triangle ABC's area. This is exactly what we just mentioned, right? If the question already give you one side, another side, and the included angle, you would be able to determine the area of the triangle right away, which is one over two times one times R times the sine 120 degrees, is it right? The two sizes times the included angles trigonomy, the sinusoidal value divided by two. Okay, what about this? How can I determine the value of my AC? How can I determine the value of my triangle AC? My triangle AEC, I have to drag it out. Triangle AEC, AEC. Okay, not to say the other stuff. Let me ask you a quick question. If a equilateral, okay, this is gonna be a equilateral triangle, right? Because all those three triangles, the black, like all the three, uh, like the obtuse triangles, they're actually congruent to each other. So therefore AC is equal to AE is equal to EC, right? AC is equal to AE is equal to EC. This is quite understandable. So let me ask you a question. If a triangle's side length is equal to A, 
then what is the area of a triangle, equilateral triangle? Who can tell me? If I have equilateral triangle, the side length is equals to A, who can tell me what is the area of my equilateral triangle? This would be a conditional react number four. When I have a quadrilateral, when I have an equilateral triangle, how can I determine the area of my equilateral triangle? Can everyone put the answers into a group chat? Yep, yep, yeah. I see everyone, almost like everyone have it correct. So that one is going to be root three over four a square, right? Try to remember this. So this is a conditional react. You're going to use them from time to time in different mass competitions. This is extremely, extremely important. Okay. As long as you have that, let's try to, let's try to, let's try to put it here. That's going to be your AC, right? I'm going to use the maybe AC. We say A, okay? A, A, A. So that's going to be root three, four, A square. But what's the value for A? I don't really care A, right? I want to present using R, right? Well, how can I determine the value of A in terms of R? That one, you're going to use the help of cosine law, right? Check it out. Within this triangle, I'm, I'm just going to drag it out, okay, to here. This is one, this is R, this is 120 degrees. How can I determine the value of A? Still remember, A will be equals to one square plus R square minus uh, so let me see this. So cosine A, slow. Cosine 120 degrees will be equals to one square plus R square minus A square to one times R. Is it right? So far so good? Okay. Now, as long as you know the value for cosine 120 degrees and also sine 120 degrees, your work is done. Is that right? How can I determine the value for sine 120 degrees and cosine 120 degrees? You can easily using the circle, the unit circle we just talked about. So that 120 degrees means what? is a degree like this, right? This is going to be what? 60 degrees. This is going to be 120 degrees. So if that's the case, who can tell me? What is my x axis? What is my x coordinate? What is my y coordinate? Who can tell me? What is my x coordinate? What is my y coordinate? if this is a unit circle. So this part is one. Who can tell me? What is my X axis? What is my Y axis? Mm -hmm. At this moment, we didn't introduce how to use the core function to determine what is cosine 120 degrees, right? But we can use the definition. 100 cosine 120 degrees means what? You're going to do a round. This is 90. This is 30, right? Put them together equals to 120, right? And then if you have a 
this is actually one. So if I drag out this red triangle, that's gonna be something like this. This is one. This is 30 degrees. I wanna determine what's the value for this. What's the value for this? Who, who can tell me? Who can tell me if you have a 30, 60, 90 degree triangle, how can I determine if the hypotenuse is already given you? It's already given to you. How can you determine the value of two legs? 30 seconds, maybe I'll give you guys 30 seconds. You can let me know how you can do that. Yeah. Maybe you were gonna ask, uh, maybe Tanya? What's the value for the, for both of them? And so the shorter one is one over two and the longer one is three over two. Is it right? This is very understandable, right? Yeah, that's perfect. But bear in mind, you are actually in the second quadrant, right? So your X value is gonna be minus one over two, right? Your Y value is gonna be positive to root two over three. Right, second quadrant, you have some positive negative thing. Okay, with that, you could basically determine what's the value for sine 120 degrees. Sine always y over r, right? Root three over two. What is cosine for 120 degrees is x over r minus one over two. Is it right? Very understandable, nothing really tricky. So if that's the case, Let's, let's try to see which one is missing. In order to have this equation, let's, let's try to have a quick look. Huh? Okay, now I have sine 120 degrees, which is root three over two. The denominator, I'm done. What about the numerator? The numerator have a square, a square. A square can be solved from this equation, of course, in the form of R, right? And also cosine, 120 degrees my equals minus one over two. So as long as you have this, it's very easy for you to determine what's the value for A. A will be R square plus R plus one. No tricky, right? You already know everything. You just basically have to plug in the value and you figure out what's the value for A. A is root R square plus R plus one. No, you're just gonna put it here. You replace A, let me change the color maybe to red. You replace A using root R square plus R plus one. You wanna take a perfect square. This is under root three over four, over one over two times R times one times root three over two. This guy equals to seven over one, right? You have nothing but a quadratic equation only has one variable, which is r. So therefore, it's like so easy for you to determine what's the value for r. So I'm gonna help you simplify. You're gonna have r square minus six r plus one equals to zero. Nothing tricky, you just basically put everything into this equation and then do a simplification. You're gonna have R square minus six R plus one. So the question asks you what? The question asks you, don't forget where we come from. The question asks you, what is the possible, what is the sum of all possible values of R? So that's gonna be what? R1 plus R2. Quadratic equation only has two solutions, right? So using the Viata's formula, R1 plus R2 will be positive six. So the correct answer for this problem will be positive six. See, this problem, it's an easy problem, right? This is, oh, this is only AMC 10, question number 19. But it looks like you use a lot of sine law, cosine law again and again, everything together. 
So that being said, sine law and cosine law is extremely important. We're going to use them very often in our AMC exam, even AMC 10, not to say AMC 12. All right, I think that's pretty much what I want to say for today's lecture. Let's have a very quick recap. Today's lecture is our lecture number one. So we talk about the basic, basic introduction of trigonometry. We never talk about the functions, the graphs, all those weird uh, identities. We just talk about something very, very easy. The definition of trigonometry from the right triangle to unit circle, and then all the way you to more angles. There are four conditional react we told you guys during this lecture. You see sine, cosine, convert to what? To tangent. Tangent go to sine, cosine. And also sometimes you, whenever you see the right triangle, you want to determine what is the area of this. Uh, if you see the equilateral triangle, how to see how to determine the area of the equilateral triangle, so on and so forth. So all those conditional react are actually scattered all over for this trigonometry part. We will take some time to basically pick them up. All right, I think that's pretty much for our lecture number one. I think it's uh, fairly basic, easy. We didn't touch a lot of complicated problems, but you know, uh, just be, bear in mind, we our like the complexity of lecture is actually growing up, growing up gradually by gradually. We're gonna see more and more flowery problems afterwards. And then afterwards, I'm gonna put the assignment into our Google Classroom, and then we'll basically take it from there. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed today's lecture and I'll see you guys for the next Monday. Bye guys, have a good one.